Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to go straight into sharing my screen because in true bus fashion, we've got a really ambitious program of events for us for us to do what we're wanting to do today. So thank you so much for coming. We're going to hopefully go into breakout rooms in a little while. So it'll be a little bit of a chance to talk with each other. And then we've, we've left time for questions at the end. And um, what we'd like to do with this webinar is first to introduce you to us to talk about foundation sensory motor, sensory motor systems, which may be something that you're already familiar with, maybe something that you've, you've not thought about at all. We're going to think with Vicky about her daughter and how um, working in this way was, was a helpful thing for them. We'd also like to talk a little bit about how buses being used clinically and in education. Really give you a whistle-stop tour of um, where we've come from and, and where, we, where we've got to. So I, the first things I'm going to tell you will be things that will already be so familiar to you. This idea of development happening from the inside out and the outside in. And those ideas that you'll be so, so, so um, used, to, used to knowing and understanding about babies having extraordinary potential, but along with that, that infinite vulnerability. And the way the brain and central nervous system of babies, the way it develops is entirely dependent on the experiences that they have. Now, none of that will be news to anybody to anybody here today. Um, but what I wanted to think with you a little bit more about is the idea of the importance of nurture for the developing for developing bodily regulation with children. So that we're very used to the idea of thinking nurturing relationships um, be helpful in the child's sense of themselves, in their um, the, the way they under, come to understand themselves and grow into the, themselves on a psychological level. But what I want us to think a little bit about today is on a bodily level, the interaction of innate potential and that facilitating environment. And by the facilitating environment, we're thinking about the, 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 the person who's looking after the child. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of where I've come to, how I've come to develop this way of working. So um, I work, I've worked for many, many years in CAMS. I've worked for 35 years in, in CAMS and um, always, I, my first training was as an occupational therapist. I then did a master's in psychoanalytic studies. I did clinical trainings in play therapy, in group work, in EMDR, all psychological kinds of, of, of therapies and was always interested in working with children where there had been adversity and trauma for whatever for whatever reason. Um, but when we were living up in Scotland in um, between 2005 and 2013, I was we were asked as a small CAM service to develop a therapeutic service for children who were in foster care in, in that area. And um, it was a fantastic opportunity to really be able to, you know, how often do you get a blank canvas for developing a service and being able to just make it as exactly as you'd like to do. So there was me, there was a, a clinical psychologist, child psychotherapist, um, art therapist and social workers. And we, we sat down together and devised our dream, our dream service. Um, and we were developed, we delivered a fairly traditional, I would say adoption support service. So about a third of our work was trying to support carers and um, parents and, and foster carers and um, we used Solihull model we used the adapted Webster Stratton we did lots of parent child game things that kind of intervention but a third of our work was direct work with with, with children young people and families and then about the third of the work was all of the system stuff and there were a significant group of children for whom this was very helpful but there were also a significant group of children who just didn't make the sorts of um, progress that we would expect to see children who were in um, families where the level of love and care and nurture was really good but there was for some reason children were just weren't able to absorb the good experiences of, of the placements that we they, they were in and we did that thing that I think lots of teams do of trying one therapy then trying another therapy and then maybe another therapy and realizing that things weren't weren't progressing and so we began to sit down and think about why why that might be and whether it wasn't just that we were doing the wrong therapy but maybe that there was something that we were missing and I guess as an OT I'd always been curious in the relationship between the body and, and the mind that we so quickly we so quickly separate out in in services and I began to notice that the way these children tended to move and their bodies worked 
felt different to typically developing children. And I was keen to try and understand that. So I um, went and did some sensory integration training and found that was, you know, phenomenally helpful in terms of mapping out the, these, these, in, this idea of innate potential and the critical stages of movement that babies need to go through to get their brain and central nervous system working as well as the, it, it needs to, to give them that, give their bodies that layer of um, bodily regulation that forms the platform for the development of um, emotion regulation, relationships, and then finally learning. Um, but what I found with sensory integration theory was that there was really nothing about the relational context. So we had that same sort of um, gap between body and mind it, th there as well. And when I came back to all of my trusty attachment theory and um, ways of understanding trauma, um, th th there wasn't much about the body. So what I wanted to do with BUS, what I have done with BUS is to really try to bring those two things together, to help the reconnect, nurture and bodily regulation and to put that at the bottom of the pyramid of, of, of child development where there has been adversity. So we have this idea that babies need nurturing relationships to feel safe and happy enough to move freely. And as they move, their bodies go through these essential patterns of movement. You know, we don't, you don't have to teach a baby how to crawl we, you, in the way that we have to then learn to drive or to ride a bike or something. And um, we have innate, these innate programs that will in the right environment just come online and the baby goes through all sorts of fantastic things in that first year of life that get their little head up and their bottom off the floor and get them moving. But they need to be in an environment where they feel safe and happy enough to be moving for, the, for their body to, to develop in that way. So what we should see for typically developing babies is as they, as they grow into their bodies, the much less energy is needed for this. And there's an increase in capacity for emotional regulation and relationships. We have this virtuous cycle of babies developing regulation through relationships and relationships through regulation. The underpinning theories of BUS are really, BUS is a, a real bottom-up approach, really getting that bottom layer of development in place using the neurosequential understanding of the impact of trauma on the developing brain, the lovely work of the um, wonderful Bruce Perry and, and his teams. Also drawing a little bit from sensory integration theory, um, not sensory integration therapy, which is Fabulous for children who've got a sensory processing disorder, but I think less relevant for children whose foundation systems are underdeveloped because of a lack of opportunity. And then all of the things that people will, I'm sure, be very familiar with, child development, attachment theory, PACE, Theraplay, DDP, all of those kind of frames of reference. So the really important thing about BUS is that we understand a child's development to have been disrupted taking that principle that babies grow into their bodies through nurturing relationships. Where there's been trauma, this process has been disrupted, but that is not a sensory processing disorder. And the best people to repair and rebuild are the grown-ups living and working with the child. So yeah. BUS isn't an intervention where children come to therapy and um, be in the therapy, Bus, the role of the bus practitioner is to join the, the parents and help them to give them a bus lens, we often talk about, help them to begin to attune to the way their child is, is moving and relating and help them to understand that in terms of the foundation sensory motor systems. Okay, so this is just what you'll be very used to, the three R's mm -hmm. of Bruce Perry, the regulate, the regulate, reason. And if we're thinking about that from a bus point of view, what we're wanting to do is to just reconnect the relational and the bodily regulation part of that pyramid. Babies need nurturing relationships to grow into their bodies, to give them the, the environment that allows them to do the moving that their body needs. And that then forms that lovely platform for emotional regulation and relating to others before we get to those dizzy heights of, of, of thinking big thoughts. So the key components of the bus model are movement, relationships and playfulness. If it's not fun, then it's very difficult to persuade a 17 year old that lying on their tummy or playing these games is going to be fun unless um, unless you can make it you can you can make it fun. So a big part of the bus practitioner is supporting parents to allow them to have enough capacity to be what their child needs them to be. 
So just really to reiterate, bus is all about disruption rather than disorder and parents and carers are the main agents of, of change. And we talk a lot about building regulation through relationships and that as we build that foundation of bodily regulation, so all sorts of things grow. But we'll come on, we'll come on to that later. And I think all of us would probably say that we work, try and work collaboratively, but I think we've, we've had to think really hard in BUS about if we're wanting parents to be the main agents of change, what do we need to do to give them um, the, the tools, the tools to, 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 to do that. And we often use the analogy of a golfer and a caddy, where we're wanting parents to be the golfers, we're wanting them to be the people out there um, at, at, at the front line of things. And the caddy, knowing both the course and the golfer and um, being able to be helpful and supportive to, to, to them and knowing that just because you can maybe do the third hole, that doesn't mean you can do the 16th hole, that, that, that things change. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is to just introduce you to Vicky, um, who is going to just briefly tell us about their daughter, who um, we worked together with, didn't we, Vicky? And we're going to do this in two parts. So we're going to introduce Vicky and her daughter, and then we're going to think about the foundation sensory motor systems so that you've got a little bit more context, a bit of a frame of reference to, to, be, to be thinking about things with. And then we're going to come back and think a little bit about how, how things changed for, for Vicky. Vicky, may I may I ask you to to tell us a little bit about your tactile? And Vicky's going to Vicky's going to start us off with the, the vestibular system. Thanks, Sarah. So the vestibular system. I'm going to give you an overview of this, um, and it's as it says there, it's the foundation of all systems. So it gives our body that stable base for movement. And we talk, when we talk about the vestibular system, we often use the illustration of the crane because without that strong base for that crane. Um, it's very difficult for it to do its work. It's very difficult for it to lift things and move things without toppling over. And it's exactly the same in our bodies as well. We need a really good core strength and stability to be able to then go on to do more complex movements. And there's two main tasks of the vestibular system. There's that core stability that I talked, uh, talked about just then. And when we think about core, sometimes we used to the term core in terms of yoga and things like that, building that kind of little six pack or whatever, although I'll never have one of those. But in, in, in bus terms, we're very much talking about core being head, neck, shoulder, girdle and trunk. So it's about core stability, but it's also about something called gravitational security. And that's that feeling of security and safety we have when we're moving on, gr on ground. And when we change surfaces, so if we're stepping down steps or different surfaces like that, we feel safe, we feel secure, and we don't feel like the ground is moving with us. And that's because all of us probably have got very good gravitational security. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Vicky. Thank you. And then how do we um, develop our vestibular system well it's from receptors that are in our ears and they respond to different kinds of movement and for typically developing babies the vestibular system is, is an adult size from 22 weeks in utero which is is pretty amazing really and then all that um, movement that that baby goes through in utero feeds that vestibular system we talk about movement being food for all of these systems. Uh, and so you can imagine a baby that's in utero that's feeling unsafe um, and perhaps his movement is being depressed as well because of drugs or alcohol, things like that. They're not getting those opportunities to move that would feed that vestibular system. And then once the baby's born, all the other different patterns of movement that the baby goes through really helps to strengthen it as well. So you'll see on the left hand side, we've got that picture, lovely picture of the baby and caregiver and the baby's probably rocking that, that um, the caregiver's probably rocking that baby really lovely and gently. And that's building that gravitational security. It's building that sense of well-being. that movement is a good thing as well. And then as Sarah was talking about before, all those innate patterns of development that babies go through feed that system again. So you've got that lovely picture in the middle of that beautiful example of core strength and stability that that baby already has to be able to put all their weight on one hand and reach out and get a toy. And the same on the right hand side, you know, movement being a fun, nice thing to do with lots of opportunities for it. 
And again, if you think about some of the children that we work with, they don't have those opportunities. They're in cots, they're perhaps in these um, bumper seats or car seats, just don't have that floor time that, that's required. And then as, as we get older, as children get older, um, over those first two years, they're building a platform for that future development. Everyday childhood play continues to feed the system. So the lovely play park adventures, you know, the kids that you see that are going up and down the slides time and time again, that's all continuing to feed that system. And what might we see if we've got underdeveloped vestibular systems, which was certainly the case with our daughter. So on the left hand side, we don't have that core strength and stability. So we can feel a uh, child can feel really floppy and have that kind of poor posture, almost like spaghetti in their middle instead of something strong keeping them together. And also there's often a disparity between upper and lower body strength. So often legs are really strong because the kids have got up early and, and started walking early. So the legs are there, but the top half just not had that opportunity to build that upper body strength. And then in terms of gravitational insecurity, if you haven't got that, then you're gonna have that fearfulness of moving. So you might be holding on to things, shuffling along, not really wanting to take your feet off the ground, or you want to be doing things really, really quickly, because if you haven't got that control, then you use speed to compensate, get through that movement, and then try and feel safe again. And then if we haven't got either of these things, when it comes to activities that need that balance and coordination, like scooting, writing scissors, playing tig. My daughter's case, she really wanted to skip, absolutely couldn't do that. Um, those kind of activities are gonna be very, very difficult. Thanks very much, Vicky, thank you. Katie, would you take us through proper reception? I'll just unmute myself. I will. It was. I was smiling listening to that bit about gravitational security. I've just been back to see a little girl this morning for the last time who was so fearful about movement, was desperate to scoot with her friends and was terrified. Um, and they've done so much lovely work. And this weekend, those of you... Um, you know Howard House, there's some lovely uh, stepping stones, which I would be terrified going over now. My gravitational security has taken a hike, but managed to get halfway across before she panicked a little bit. But came back again, didn't fall in, didn't manage to make that, manage to make that little step across the, the nothingness of the water, uh, which was just so, so lovely. It's those things, isn't it? It's where you, when you, but when you can trust your body to do what you need it to do. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about proprioception, and it's another process that begins in utero and is really dependent on having that lovely, lovely uh, experience of movement, um, even before you come out into the world. And it, like the vestibular system, continues to grow as we hold the baby, as we carry the baby, as we play with the baby, and we have that safe kind of environment in which they can begin to explore and to move. And um, Babies move when they're in a lovely, safe, nurturing parent caregiver relationship. Um, you know, even if you look at teeny tiny babies, arms and legs will be going all over the place. Um, it's whole body movements that you that you that you start to see, and it's really. I think it's for me the trickiest of the foundation systems that we'll talk about to get our heads around. But it's it's I think of it as the beginning of knowing our body from the inside out. Um, so it's about understanding those messages that we're getting from inside our bodies. Um, so it's about lots of things, the pro proprioception. Um, part of it is about the quality of our movement. So what we want to see, for example, when children are walking or when they're running, is lovely, smooth, well-coordinated, well-modulated movement. Um, so we've got both sides, we've got body sides. No, we've got both sides of the body working in a really lovely integrated way. So left and right, working together, top and bottom, working together. Um, and in order for that to happen, we've got to build up a, a really good detailed body map. And if you think if you're thinking about a body map, I always use this analogy of in the in the summer, I went up to um, Scotland on holiday. And we were in a teeny tiny little cottage on a teeny tiny little country road. I needed a really good and detailed map to find that cottage and to find all those little nooks and crannies on the, you know, the lovely little beaches. 
that basic map that just would have shown me route one all the way up there wouldn't have been enough would it it have probably got me to scotland it probably have got me to fife but it wouldn't have given me access to all those other hidden places and if we're thinking about that idea of building up a good, good body map i think that's a nice analogy for it really is we want the fine detail that comes through that constant exchange of information between our muscles and joints our brain and central nervous system to build that sense of where our bodies start and finish and where our bodies are in space Thanks, Sarah. Um, and that's how we start to own our bodies to feel, you know, you hear that, set, that phrase sometimes, don't you, about really feeling comfortable in your own skin. I, I always think of that when I think about proprioception. So it's about really owning our physical self. Um, and if we've got good proprioception, we don't really give it much thought. It's just an automatic process. But where we've not got it and where we're needing to give lots of conscious energy to movement, to how much pressure or force to use in a movement, to um, you know, how, how do I negotiate getting through that gap <laughs> without banging and clattering into something? Or how do I know where I'm going without looking at my feet to know where they are? Um, it's so much energy, isn't it? So much good energy being used up that we could be using for other things. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and it's those repeated patterns of move, movement again, isn't it? All of this is about repetition. It's not just that um, we put a baby on their tummy once and they're building that lovely body map and then it's done. It's the repeated patterns of movement that build those neural pathways. And it, that's what happens when babies are teeny tiny. And I suppose it's what we're trying to do in bus when we go back to fill in some of those early developmental gaps. And we're absolutely gaining our control from the top down. That's what we should be doing. Vicky just talked about those kids that have gained it from the bottom up. So they've got those lovely, super strong legs, but their head, neck and shoulders are not so strong. And that comes when you have loads of lovely time like this baby on your tummy, lifting your head, pushing up on your arms to, to lift your body up. Eventually, as Sarah said, that little bum popping up as you get into a crawling position and you're doing that lovely rocking backwards and forwards kind of movement before you start to actually crawl. Or even before that, you're commando crawling, you're pulling yourself along on your tummy. You're getting all that beautiful pro proprioceptive input when you're doing that, but you only get that input and you only build that system if you're having lovely time on the floor in a safe environment with somebody in front of you putting that uh, teddy a little bit further ahead or the, can you reach for that rattle? You know, all of that done in that lovely, playful way. Thanks, Sarah. And so where proprioceptive systems are underdeveloped, we see lots of different things. We see kids who are whose movements are who kind of jerk in and out of movements, whose movements are just just that don't have that lovely smooth coordinated um, sense that you that you want when they're running. So it might be that the they're running and their arms are floating behind or their arms are just not useful to them at all. We hear lots of families talking about their kids literally falling, tripping over nothing, tripping over thin air, banging into door frames that they walk through 60 times a day. And lots and lots of movement and fidgeting, seeking that input that lets them know where their bodies are. So think about, you know, those kids who were sat on the carpet and they're constantly touching something, a person, a wall, the floor. That constant movement is just helping them to get a sense of where their bodies are in space. Um, again, lots of energy needed for all of that, isn't there? Um, must be a hard little body to live in, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Katie. And I think what we what we kind of really take as a starting point for bus is that it's not that we don't think there could be any other explanations for children who look like this, for children who are fidgety or struggling to stay on task or impulsive or um, struggling to make connections with other people. We, we absolutely understand um, that there could be other explanations for that. But what we really are keen to do is to have as our starting point the idea that where there's been early adversity, there's no way those foundation sensory motor systems could have developed as well as they should have done. And so we're not seeing that child functioning as, as their body was intended to. And so what we always want to do to start with is to have a look at that and just bear in mind the possibility that perhaps some or all or bits of their presentation will be related to those gaps in foundation sensory motor systems, because we know that it doesn't matter 
that those those systems didn't come online at the right time where we've got a, a loving nurturing attuned relationship then we can support parents and carers to go back and fill in those those gaps which bring us on to the tactile system which is really where we have the physiological and the psychological absolutely coming together in a way that when you're repairing systems is so helpful to us so if we think of our tactile systems as being responsible for making sense of stimuli that come from outside the body, our proprioceptive system, as Katie was, was, was talking about, it's like that internal body map. And if we think of the tactile system as um, helping us to understand our environment, what we smell, what we hear, what we taste, what we touch, what touches us, all of those things are subsumed under this umbrella of the tactile system. And we've got a huge overlap with the tactile system between the physiological and the psychological because of the way the system is set up in, in, in the newborn and the way it's intended to um, develop. As with all of these systems, we're giving you such a whistle-stop tour, but with the tactile system, it's just helpful to bear in mind that idea of um, is the child over or under responding to the stimulus, the stimulus that's coming from outside their body? So those children who are hugely oversensitive to noise, as Vicky, um, I don't think mentioned, but her, her, her daughter, if there were loud noises, would, would, would hide under the table or would crouch down on the pavement. So we could see that little system massively over responding to, to, to that stimulation. But equally, we, we, we probably all know of children who don't register pain in, in the way that we would expect. And perhaps I've had a, an arm that's been broken for a few days before anybody's noticed that Perhaps it's hanging a bit oddly, but the child's not no noticing that. Or children not noticing when they need to go to the toilet, not noticing when their tummies are full or empty. All, all, of, all of those things we think of. And Beacon House, I'm sure you're all aware of Beacon House and the wonderful work they do. But that idea of window intolerance and hypervigilance are all really useful here. So what we're just going to think about for a moment is the physiological development of the system, which is entirely dependent on the care that a baby has. And again, where there's been adversity, there will be disruption to this and all of the systems. So the tactile system, if we think of the, our skin as the largest organ of our body, we have tactile receptors all over our, our, our skin in that kind of layer, just, just, just below the surface. And when babies are born, their first task is to survive. And so the way their body is wired, the way their body is set up in the newborn is, is for survival. So we have different receptors that have different jobs um, in, our, in our tactile system. But for the newborn, the receptors are all wired for defensive functioning. So everything that's about keeping that baby safe is paramount. OK, so if we think of it being like bulbs, think of those early receptors being like the bulbs that are flowering. And then we've maybe got bulbs growing below the surface that will come onto line, come come to flower later. But to begin with, we, 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 we've got those early flowering bulbs up there. And for those defensive receptors to recede and those later flowering bulbs, which are about discrimination and being able to stay in the moment of the experience, for that process to happen the way it should, babies need to be having consistent, loving, nurturing care that meets their physiological and their psychological needs. And in those circumstances, as babies, you can always imagine little babies' brains thinking, OK, I don't need to keep looking out for myself because actually there's somebody doing a reasonably good job of that. I seem to get fed well enough. I seem to get picked up often enough. I seem to get this. There's a lovely face there for me to smile at and play with. As those things happen, those, those those defensive receptors can recede so that the receptors that really start to allow for connection, that allow the baby to connect with their caregiver, that allow the connect to with the outside world, to get curious, to get interested in things and to um, make sense of the world. All of those can then grow. And what we really do in BUS is to think a lot about this, this shift from defensive to discriminatory function or from survive to thrive, however, is easiest to, to, to think about it. And lots of an individual child's programme will, will really capitalise on this because what we see so often with children who've experienced early adversity is that they're in that state of high alert. That little system is still 
constantly on the prowl and on the lookout for danger, even when the, 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 the danger has passed. So what we use a lot in bus is the physiological touch, taste, smell, nurture kind of activities to just settle that little limbic system on a, on a physiological and a psychological level. Okay, Nikki, may I come back to you now that we've explained a little bit more about those foundation sensory motor system. I, we, live in, we, live, we, we live in Leeds and I work a couple of days a week in Leeds, the Leeds CAM service, seconded into fostering and adoption services. And it was in one of the, the, the therapeutic social work team um, that, that Katie and I for, for, first met. Um, and we thought it might be helpful to just hear a little bit more about the process of integrating something like BUS into that kind of team. Um, the rest of the work, the rest of my week is um, heading up this fantastic growing team of, of, of BUS practitioners and doing training and, and, and clinical work. But Katie, please, could you talk to us about the therapeutic team? I will do, yeah. So before um, I jumped onto the actual bus with Sarah a year or so ago, I spent 18 uh, years working in the therapeutic social work team in Leeds, um, initially as a social worker and then the last six years or so managing that service. Big service, really well established, um, started off with all therapeutic social workers and then over the years we, um, we became a really good, healthy, multidisciplinary team actually with clinical psychology, speech and language, OT, and most of our work, probably about 70% of it was working with children um, in care, children who were looked after on supervision orders, um, or children with lead social workers anyway, citywide service, super experienced, you know, it's one of those teams where if you join, you just, you, you don't leave really, great place to be, a lovely, lovely variety of work. Um, and we, you know, it's a bit like Sarah was saying with her old team, we offered a really lovely range of psychological therapies. It was an incredibly skilled team, systemic family therapy, art, play therapist, EMDR, EFT, MBR, DDP, you name it, we had it. And, uh, and, and for many children, you know, we were able to offer the right kinds of well-evident psychological therapies in, in, to, to support them really. Uh, in in settling in their foster families, in um, processing their early traumas, and and that worked really really impactfully um, for lots of kids. But I, I suppose for some years before I met Sarah, I'd always felt like there was something missing that we were mi you know, we were we were learning more and we've learned more and more, haven't we, over the last ten years or so in particular about um, that body brain connection, about you know all the Bessel van der Kolk stuff of the body keeping the score and I really felt like there was there was stuff around sensory processing the sensory experience of many of the children we were supporting that we just didn't we weren't confident in thinking about or helping with um so I was on the hunt really I was on the hunt for what might that be well what's that missing link really thanks Sarah um so again, you, I'm, I'm sure as I speak, you'll all have this group of kids in your head, that small but significant group of children who, despite everything, you know, chucking everything but the kitchen sink in at, at them and their caregiving systems, um, they just weren't making the progress that we would have hoped for, really. And we were, you know, I, I think we did a really good job at really supporting the caregiving systems around those children. It wasn't all about, oh, let's fix the child, the opposite of that, actually. Um, but all of our focus was on emotional well-being, trauma processing, not so much on the bodily regulation stuff. And at the time, I was doing a bit of work um, outside of the team um, with a little girl who was adopted, who had had a really tricky early start, heroin in utero, born with a really complex medical condition that meant she had a couple of surgeries in the first couple of weeks of life, six months then laying flat on her back. Well, knowing now what I know, you know, obvious, it was, it's obvious, isn't it, that her little foundation systems would not have had the opportunity to grow in the way they needed to. And she was the kid, really, that kind of triggered everything off because I found out that Sarah was working in Leeds, same as me, and I thought, oh, I'll go along to an intro day. And I went with this family just to have a, have a think about whether this could be helpful for that little girl. But I also had the team in my mind, really. Um, and it was from that day that I came away thinking, yep, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I want this. I want this in my team. This is it. Uh, 
Black on Sarah, please. Um, and so uh, I had a call with Sarah and I think in my naive little brain, because she uh, makes it sound so simple, just thought, oh, we can all do this, you know, really skilled team. We can all learn to do this. We'll all be doing it with it before you know it. And Sarah uh, helped me gently understand that it's not quite so simple as that. And so um, I was able to get a little pot of money to commission an introductory day, a bit like the intro webinars that the bus team runs now for the whole service. So we hit everybody. So everybody had a basic understanding of foundation systems, what happens when there's a, a disruption. And then we trained up over 18 months, two years, really, a little sub team of six practitioners who were interested in the model, who were comfortable in using their bodies, uh, who were um, comfortable in getting down on the floor and commando crawling and pretending they were a mermaid. All of that is really important, together with the playfulness, of course. Um, and we learned through observation, through co-working uh, opportunities. Once we to kind of learned the basics, we, we worked with children together so that we made a little bit of a wingman uh, while we were learning. Um, and some supervision and ongoing training and development um, was part of that with Sarah too, until eventually we had a very forward thinking commissioner who... Uh, saw fit to uh, fund Sarah to be seconded into the team and then we could really start to grow. So it was a slow process, but um, a really such a critical moment, I think, in the development of that team and in the offer that we were able to then make to children who were looked after in, in Leeds. And so it was definitely a, a missing link. I'm not saying it's the answer to everything. We would, we wouldn't suppose to be, to, to be saying that, but we did get to the point, or I got to the point where with every new referral, I was thinking bus first. Um, very much we're thinking about bus as the foundation for any future offer. And actually for lots of children, what we found was that when we had helped them and their carers to build those foundation systems to a good enough level, they didn't necessarily need anything else. They didn't need the psychological therapies, but where they did, they were in much better place to, uh, going back to what Hetty said right at the beginning of the day, in a much better place to be able to access it because their bodies were better regulated. Um, we the, the, the thing that sometimes gets in the way is, is whether that caregiving system has the capacity to be doing the work along with us because, as Sarah said, it's not about them children being brought to see us once a week it's about what happens in all those spaces in between it's about really integrating bus into family life in the way that Vicky's just so beautifully described and it's a short intensive burst of work so we need that caregiving system to have capacity to do it not just physically but you know the headspace to be thinking about how do I make this fun and um, and playful um I'll do, won't it? There's a little whistle stop, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. That's so, that's so helpful. Um, bus is still at a um, an er not at an early stage of development, but we're just still continuing to watch it, watch it grow and change. And what we've been really keen to try and do alongside that is to build evidence, um, so that we haven't just got anecdotal evidence, but that we've also got something a little bit more robust. And um, we're beginning to try and um, submit things for publication and have made relationships with local universities. So the University of Leeds and the University of Hull, particularly the clinical psychology departments where their clinical psychologists in training have to do a mixture of one year service evaluation projects and doctoral thesis. So we've had five studies of, of, of BAS to date. Um, and I was just going to talk to you about, about a, a few of them here. The, the first one I wanted to, to, to mention because it was one that um, we did within Katie's team, um, looking at um, foster carer and social worker um, experiences of using the bus programme. And um, Kat, who was one of the, the, the clinical psychologists in training, interviewed five foster carers and five social workers to talk to them about their experience of, of, of using bus with, with the children that they were either working with or looking after. And there were four ma main themes that came out of this. Um, the first being that you can't build a house on wobbly foundations and the feeling that bus was like a missing piece of the jigsaw, the chance to go back and build foundations again. And as Katie said, that that then gave a, a platform for, for other work to happen or, 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 or not. The other theme that, that really emerged was about how multifaceted the needs of these children are and how complex they, 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 they are. Um, and 
foster for foster carers it was this idea that um a children's physical difficulties things like not being able to stand without support or sit at a table or you 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 use cutlery um that all of those physical difficulties actually really got in the way of children being able to progress in other areas of their life and left them feeling um, hopeless and very different to their peers. Um, foster carers really like the practical emphasis of BUS and the emphasis on let's build the foundation sensory motor systems that will allow children to do those things, which almost is like giving them a ticket into the, the, the normal world. Another theme was this idea of lots of ingredients making it work. And this really reflected the hard work that the intervention is. Um, parents and carers being, being main agents of change um, means that they, it, they are working day in, day out, trying to build these systems, trying to make, make them fun. Um, and, and social workers talked a lot about that, that it looks really simple, but actually doing it is, is much more complicated. And it was great to hear that gains that were made were far wide ranging and matching the needs. Um, bodily awareness and regulation, but that then giving a platform for the development of self-esteem and, and friendships. But also, and we're so always so conscious to emphasise this, us isn't the answer to everything. The, the needs of children are complex and while for some children bus was enough and allowed them to really make use of the good experiences they were having in their in their care environments for others it was giving a platform for the psychological therapies so we're, we're never suggesting um oh forget everything you know and just think about bus what we're wanting to do is to offer bus as a um another tool in in in, in your kit a lens to begin to look at things through but we would say quite an early lens is is most useful so we also Harriet Haslam, who was a is a senior prac in social work, did a master's in at the local university, which was around innovations in professional practice, and she <laughs> undertook a study, an exploratory study of the impact of bus model on the therapeutic skill set of carers, where she in, she interviewed four foster carers who completed an intervention that she and I had run together down there, and um, it was interesting to hear those carers talk about being better able to understand development and that, the, that their ability to interpret the physical and emotional presentation of the, the children allowed them to be more attuned in their caregiving. And a key component in that was their, their role as the main agents of change that I think for foster carers, being seen as an expert in their, in their child is, is, not, is not usually the, the position they found themselves inhabiting. And that um, increasing the child, the foster carers self esteem and confidence and giving them additional skills, they they were then able to to see tangible changes and um, pro progress the work that they were doing with the children. And then finally, we just um, finished. Uh, Chloe's just finished her doctoral thesis on um, cognitive changes that parents report when their families have been through the bus model and really just trying to, to, to think about cognitive, emotional, social, behavioural, language and expressive skills and um, children's, their parents' level of understanding of their child development. All of these things being um, significantly impacted by an intervention which really is focusing on bodily regulation and relationships, but seeing lots and lots of other things shift. So where are we up to at the moment? At the moment, BUS is, we have the kind of three main arms of BUS, the clinical work, which Katie heads up. Um, we have bases, physical bases in Halifax and Harrogate up in Yorkshire. But we, I would say probably about 70% of our, our work is with families from all over the, the UK and a much smaller percentage is face-to-face is, is -face work. The, um, one of the upsides of COVID has been helping us to develop a way of delivering bus when we couldn't be in a room with, with children. And I think um, for a lot of us, that becomes our favourite way of working because the quality of relationship you, you, you can get is, is fan and fantastic. We also do lots of training. We do training, we're often commissioned to train organisations or virtual schools or, or, or social work teams or independent providers around the UK. But we also offer trainings in Leeds um, for, for people who are interested in developing their skills in this way of working. And then the third arm is group work. So BUS isn't a um, 
kind of a manualized program of, of, of work. We can't just say, okay, do this, this, and this, and those foundation systems will, will, will grow. That there's that complex interaction between what an individual child's history has been, what the environment is, what parents' capacity is, where the gaps are in those foundation systems. Because usually what you see is some gaps, but some areas of strength. And it's putting all of those things together and devising a program. But what we have tried to do is to think about stages, very early stages of development and um, offering groups for at, at, at that stage. So I, I run a, um, a number of groups with, with preschool children and their, and their foster carers um, or carers where we're really in a group setting beginning to build those foundation sensory motor systems and that's children from about 18 months to about four and um, the first collaboration of that was in conjunction with the virtual school in Leeds and um, we continue to run those groups with the virtual school that we call our school their school readiness program really wanting to um, have some impact on those educational underachievement for children who are hard looked after so um, thinking that if we can build foundation sensory motor systems before a child starts school, then that they're at least in a position to perhaps be able to absorb what's in school. Um, that also, we're also about to, we're about to do a pilot in children's centres actually in Leeds with, um, again, in partnership with the virtual school for children who are looked after or who, no, not children who are looked after, children who have a social worker. Um, and trying to um, work to um, skill up the, the children's centre staff in this way of working, but run groups alongside them for those children who are still living with, with, with birth families, but where there's a fairly significant level of concern. And we also um, have started running groups for new adopters and their newly adopted children. So just at that point, as, as, as young children are moving into new adoptive placements, bringing those um, new parents and, and children together in a 12 week group pr program, supporting the development of foundation sensory motor systems, but also doing so much work to um, care for and, and, um, and nurture those new, those new parents as they get to know their children. And there's something about the emphasis being on very practical, physical things. You know, there's nothing like lying on your tummies beside each other and playing 10 in the bed and all rolling over and bumping into each other to break down some of those, those, those barriers between parents and between professionals and, um, and, and, and parents. And having that very practical focus and giving parents something very tangible and practical to be doing between sessions. And that what we see is the byproduct of that is that lovely um, relationship growing. It's also a great way actually of being able to, I think the best neurodevelopmental screen I've ever done and being able to catch things very early on in the life of the child. I'm thinking about last week in the group um, with the little, one little boy, little kind of three-year-old who is just still at that point of really needing, we're really needing to help him attach to, 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 to mum, wandering around, wanting to be with other people and constantly bringing him back to mum, but being able to manage mum's feelings that maybe I'm not the right mum for this boy, maybe it wasn't, maybe they made a mistake with the match and being able to say, no, 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 you are, you are what this little one needs, let's help you and let's support you. And really helpful to have that group forum to do that rather than that being in the play park or um, when they go down the street, but being able to, to hold on to it and, and, and support. Okay, this is just a really quick next step slide. All of this information is available on the website, but just to say there are loads of possibilities, there's loads of training and there are lots of opportunities available. Because what I wanted to think about was really our dream is not to build a kind of a bus empire in, in Yorkshire, but what we really want is to work towards the being understanding and consideration of a child's foundation sensory motor systems at the point at which people are getting concerned about them. And for carers then to be supported so that these systems can be rebuilt and re restoring that balance of bodily regulation and nurture. And then just before we finish, a picture speaks louder than words. And I just wanted to show you, we do lots of before and after measures with bus. And one of the things we ask children to do is to draw the best picture they can of a whole person when we meet. And then um, a couple of months, a couple of months later, um, with these children, these were three months apart. The, the, the clinical intervention often takes place over three or four months. And um, this was a little girl who was six years and six months at the point at which we, we met. And you can see the drawing on the left-hand side is her before picture. And um, as well as 
some significant gaps in body parts and that kind of tent that goes from her head to her, her feet. While she was drawing that picture, she fell off her chair over and over again. That when her body, when her mind wasn't concentrating on sitting and she was trying to do drawing, she, she just didn't have enough core stability or a good enough body map to be able to hold herself in position. She also had to turn the piece of paper around every time there was a change of direction. So trying to draw that circle for the head, the piece of paper was going round and round and round. So it took her absolutely ages to draw. And their, their family were a wonderful family. They worked beautifully um, with, 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 with me over a few months. And you can see that second picture that she was so proud to do that the three months later that had such detail. She spent ages drawing those circles and she was just blown away with herself at how fantastic she was that she was able to make her pencil go around in a circle because by that stage it was her fingers doing the drawing rather than that kind of whole arm movement we had when we met but you can also see in terms of the body map um what Katie would find her butches on the east nook of Fife with that right hand drawing whereas she'd have been she'd have been scuppered with, with the left hand one and then finally, this is another little boy who I happened actually to see on the same day. And um, he was a real crashy, bangy, doing your things at a million miles an hour sort of boy. And when he draw that, drew that picture of his body, I thought, well, no wonder. Imagine trying to do anything in that body that had any finesse or quality of movement. And then when he when we met again that, that three months later and he drew this picture, I was, um, as we often do, saying, should we have look at that picture we drew when we first met together and um, I got it out and he was so impressed with himself and I would say please could I show that to to other people who are who are thinking about bus and he was really delighted he's a little boy who loves being videoed and he was really keen that he, I show it but he wanted you to all to understand that what he's doing in this picture is slaying a dragon so we not only have we can see that little body growing but also with it that sense of agency that his body will do what he needs and wants it to do and you know a lot of six-year-old boys need to be need to be busy slaying dragons okay so thank you you we've given you a whistle stop tour of bus i hope it hasn't felt too fast there's loads more information about bus on our website and there are a couple of books if you're interested in reading more that first one improving sensory processing it's like just a really kind of gentle introduction to, to things and then the second book building sensory motor systems is a much more in-depth so when people are thinking of training in bus the, 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 that's that's more the book that we're wanting them to get but jkp contacted me the other day to say would you like a discount code and i'd be delighted to have a discount code so if you order from the jkp website um then you can use that discount code lloyd20 to get 20 percent off and they didn't put an end date on that so i'm not quite sure not quite sure where that when that stops also if you want to get in touch with us please do our, our email address is info at busmodel.org